In this video, we're going to go through everything that you need to know about an FHA loan to see if you can qualify for it and if it's the right loan for you. By the end of this video, you're going to know more about FHA loans than most first-time homebuyers and probably more about FHA loans than a lot of loan officers. So this is going to help you see if this is the right loan for you and if you should pick it and be able to win an offer with an FHA loan. So there's also timestamps along the bottom if you want to scroll to different sections that are more applicable to you. So first, let's go through some highlights. This is one of the easiest loans to qualify for out of the four main types of loans. You have conventional, FHA, VA, and USDA. This is one of the easiest because it allows lower credit scores, a higher debt to income ratio, which we'll talk through, um, and is more lenient on things like bankruptcy and late payments. Now, a lot of people pitch this as a loan for first time home buyers, mainly just because it has a lower down payment and it's really flexible with who can qualify for it. But you don't have to be a first time home buyer to qualify for this FHA loan. Now, one of the biggest things about FHA is the credit score that you're allowed to have when you qualify for it. So conventional loans require a 620 minimum FICO credit score. FHA actually allows you to have a 500 credit score. Um, and if you have a 500 credit score, you have to put 10% down. If you have a 580 and higher, then you can do 3.5% down. Now, you can also have a 740, an 800, a 620. You can have a much higher credit score and still qualify for an FHA loan. This isn't just for if you have lower end credit. Now, a lot of people have questions about, hey, I can't find a lender who does 500 credit score. I will show you uh, more about this in an upcoming slide. So this is best for lower to mid credit score borrowers. And the reason most people get this loan is primarily because they can't qualify for something like a conventional loan that has uh, maybe cheaper mortgage insurance. And I'll go through the whole loan comparison thing in an upcoming slide. Um, but that's mainly who this is best for. Um, also, this is not something that's going to be a long-term loan. I'm going to show you the strategy that you need to use that I call the bridge strategy to make sure that you're taking advantage of the FHA loan so that it doesn't take advantage of you. So quick pros and cons here at the top. Bro, super easy to qualify for. If you can't qualify for a traditional conventional loan, then FHA is usually one of the easiest places to get approved for a mortgage. Um, second is it does have a low interest rate. Uh, it has a low down payment, 3.5% if you have a 580 credit score and above. Also, there's some flexible rehab options where you could buy a home, get money to do the work for it, and then increase the value that way. And there's also some uh, investing options that I'll talk through. Uh, this is a strategy called house hacking that you can do with an FHA loan. Now, some cons that we need to run through. Costly mortgage insurance. This is one of the biggest downsides of FHA. It's easy to get approved, has a low down payment, but the problem is you pay for that in what's called mortgage insurance, and I'll show you that as well. Also, the loan limits are pretty low. Uh, considering the median home price in the US, uh, it's not super high. It kind of tracks just a little bit lower than the median home price in the US. So if you're looking to get a really big house, um, it might not be the best strategy with an FHA loan. Also, uh, it has stricter appraisal requirements. So something like a conventional loan will allow you to do something that's a little bit more as is condition or, um, you know, you can do some work on where FHA kind of wants a move in ready home unless you're using a rehab loan with it. Also, FHA is not super favored by sellers. A lot of sellers kind of look at FHA as uh, they think the buyer um, can't qualify and they think that the financing is going to fall through. And that really is just it's stupid that sellers think that way because if you're approved for a loan, you're approved for a loan. It doesn't mean that if you're approved for FHA, things are going to fall through the cracks. That's not how it works. But unfortunately, that's how sellers can sometimes view it. So some big changes that have happened recently that no one is seeming to cover um, is number one is the market is changing and FHA is becoming more accepted. So these past couple of years, as home prices have increased a lot, we've seen a lot of competition, a lot of multiple offers. What ends up happening is a seller might get, you know, or was getting like 20 different offers on their home. And a lot of those were for cash or conventional financing, which again, sellers can view as more favorable. Um, I don't think it's fair that they do that. And I think it's, uh, it's not really logical that they do that, but that's the reality of the situation. So as the market switches back to more neutral territory and into more of a buyer's market, you start to see FHA more accepted. Whereas it might've been difficult for somebody to get an FHA uh, loan approved, now it's becoming a lot more accepted. Also, there are new loan limits. So as home prices increase, the loan limits for FHA loans increase as well. 
Also, with FHA, you used to have to get uh, flood insurance through the government. That was just the requirement. Now you can actually get private flood insurance, which should lower the cost if you live in a flood zone. Um, FHA COVID rules have also been relaxed quite a bit, uh, primarily with uh, when it comes to income. FHA was a little bit tough to get approved if you were uh, laid off or you, had, um, you were self-employed and your income dropped or you got reduced hours with COVID. Uh, lenders were primarily looking at that lower income um, because of COVID, and now they've relaxed those rules a little bit where your income can be averaged since you've been back at work uh, from a COVID uh, lapse, whether it was reduced income or laid off or whatever that circumstance was. Also, rental history can now be accepted on FHA loans to help nudge you towards an approval. So all these things kind of putting together, FHA has evolved quite a bit, even over just the past year. So first of all, what in the world is FHA? What does this stand for? Um, this stands for the Federal Housing Administration. So this is uh, just a part of HUD, which is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. None of this matters a ton, but this is what the acronym stands for. And this is the government's uh, kind of goal was to provide easier financing for people where conventional loans used to require like 20% down. They usually required low debt to income ratios. Things have changed quite a bit, but this is where FHA evolved into um, providing more housing options for people who couldn't qualify for conventional loans. But this is a type of loan offered by many different lenders. Okay, This is not just offered through one specific lender. Most lenders offer an FHA loan. Now, it's important to note that in this video, we're talking about the base guidelines set by FHA. Okay, These are set by uh, the government entity that insures these loans. So you have the base guidelines, but each lender gets to add what they call an overlay. So for instance, we talked about the minimum 500 credit score. A lot of lenders add an overlay. Basically, it's a rule stacked on top of a rule. So the base rule is 500 is the minimum. Lenders can, if they want to, say their own minimum is, let's say, 640. They're allowed to do that. So I'm going to show you how you can get around those overlays in this video as well. Also, FHA does not make loans. They don't issue loans. What they do is they insure payments to investors. So for instance, a lender would offer an FHA loan and then the FHA, they actually insure that mortgage so that in the event that uh, let's say you don't pay back that loan, uh, the FHA can actually come in and help that lender recoup any losses there. But because of that, the requirements on, on things like the appraisal can be more strict um, in the event that there is uh, you know, a foreclosure. They want to make sure that they can sell the home um, without you know, losing as much money as possible. So really quickly about me, um, I'm a certified mortgage advisor licensed in all 50 states, and I work with a team of uh, quite a few helpful mortgage advisors. Um, and our goal really is to provide home loans that fit your budget to help clarify some of the confusing uh, parts of the mortgage process in videos like this. So you're welcome to email me. Also, what we do is we do free home loan consults at whenthehouseyoulove.com. We'd love to start a conversation and walk you through some of these programs and see how we can help you. So one of the main requirements with FHA is the minimum down payment. Of course, you can always put more down than the minimum if you want to. But as we talked about in the beginning, if you have a FICO score between a 580 plus, so anything 580 FICO score and higher, you can do 3.5% down. So in an example, um, where let's say we're looking at a $425,000 home, 3.5% down would be $14,875. Okay. Now, if you have anywhere between a 500 to a 579, you need to put 10% down. So in our example of a $425,000 home, that would be $42,500. Okay. So then we work into down payment assistance. Um, FHA is one of the most common loans to have with down payment assistance. And the way that it works is down payment assistance is added to an FHA loan. So even though that the minimum down payment on an FHA loan is 3.5% down, if you have a 580 credit score or higher, down payment assistance is a program where you could get additional assistance to reduce the 3.5% down payment. And this comes in a bunch of different uh, like flavors, if you will. Um, you have different like grants, you have second liens, you have uh, loans that you have to pay back, tons of different options. But ultimately, these down payment assistance uh, programs often will have a higher interest rate or different kind of strings attached. For instance, there's a lot of down payment assistance programs where they'll say you have to live in the home for 
let's say five years. And then after five years, uh, you have to pay back half of it when you sell it. Um, or there's some that reduce the amount that you have to pay back. There's some that require a payment on it where it's basically a second loan. There's all different types of down payment assistance. Usually it's one of the more financially best options to not go with down payment assistance. Um, but I'll run through an example of down payment assistance program uh, that we work with uh, nationally. Um, and again, you can just go to winthehouseyoulove.com, set up a consult, and we can walk you through this. Um, one that we work with is, is called an empowered down payment assistance. And this is a forgivable grant, meaning that you walk out of the closing and it's completely forgiven. You don't have to pay that money back. Where a lot of down payment assistance programs do have this kind of, uh, you know, if you wanted to sell, you'd have to pay back a portion or all of the down payment assistance. So this would provide 2% to 3.5% of the down payment has a 620 minimum credit score. Um, and then you need to either be a first time home buyer, be under 140% of the area and median income, be in an underserved census tract or current or retired first responder, educator, medical personnel, civil servant, or military. Um, so you can see uh, you have the normal FHA loan, but then the down payment assistance program on it has its own rules on top of it. And there are thousands of down payment assistance programs, all that have their own different rules to them. Um, and even with a program like this, you would expect somewhere around a 1% higher rate. So if on an FHA loan, you were getting close to, let's say a 6% rate, you might be looking at closer to a 7% rate. And this, again, depends on tons of different down payment assistance programs. So we have the down payment, which is 3.5% for most people. Unless you have less than a 580 credit score, you're looking at 10%. Then you have closing costs. And closing costs are going to be associated with all lenders. Um, so closing costs are going to be things like your appraisal, your title insurance, uh, your recording fees, any taxes in your county or state. Um, also things like your homeowner's insurance uh, and uh, property tax escrow as well. So closing costs on FHA loans are going to be the same as all other loans, except for one big exception, and that's the FHA upfront mortgage insurance premium in your closing costs. I'm going to get to that in a future slide here in just a sec. So I want to look at a real FHA quote with you. Now, it's important to note, this is an educational scenario. Um, this is not your quote uh, specifically for you. This is just an example quote here. Okay, so we can see on this quote, um, this is what's called a loan estimate. And this is given to every single buyer when they get under contract for a home. Um, and so this allows you to take a look at uh, different loans side by side. So we can see this is an FHA loan um, for a $425,000 purchase price. We're getting a loan of four fifteen eight forty nine. dollars um, and this is because there is an FHA mortgage insurance premium added into the loan amount, which again, I'll explain here in the future slide. Uh, so we can see where the interest rate could possibly be, what the monthly principal and interest would be. Really what I want to take a look at though, is what closing costs could look like on an FHA loan. So in section A up here would be the cost of working with a lender. Um, so depending on who you work with, the costs are going to change. Um, this is a, a quote from us to one of our clients. Uh, so we didn't have any origination costs here on this loan. Um, section B, you're going to run into things like an appraisal, uh, a credit report fee, and this is the mortgage insurance premium that FHA loans have. So you can see it's $5,724. Um, and so what ends up happening is this actually gets financed into your loan amount. It gets added to uh, your loan amount with an FHA loan. Most people don't pay this out of pocket. Um, then you also have your title fees. So you get to choose a title company that you work with. Um, so these would be an estimate of fees here. Also, your county usually is going to record uh, or charge a cost to record the deed and the mortgage. Um, usually is somewhere around 200 bucks. Then you also have prepaids. So when you get a loan, you're going to pay 12 months of your homeowner's insurance up front. Um, of course, you get to choose your homeowner's insurance company. Uh, you also have prepaid interest. This is from the time that you close till your first payment is due. Um, then you have an escrow account. FHA does require all loans to have an escrow account. This is where a little bit of homeowner's insurance and property taxes are set in a, an account that the lender manages for you. Um, and this is because those bills are usually due annually or semi-annually. So instead of you having a big bill due once or twice a year, the lender collects monthly payments from you, sets it into the account, and then they will be in charge of paying your taxes and insurance for you. Um, then you also have an optional title insurance policy offered to you by the title company as well. So that all comes down where you add your closing costs plus your down payment giving you a cash to close. Um, and I'll walk through as well how you can reduce your closing costs by asking the seller 
for a credit. So it's important to remember that uh, a lot of people talk about, you know, loan programs as just the down payment. You do still have closing costs. Um, closing costs are probably going to be a good estimate is around 2% of the purchase price. Um, of course, we can get the seller to pay some of that uh, as well. But if you really want to look at a detailed quote, um, just ask us for one here. Just go to winthehouseyoulove.com and schedule a call with us. So for your down payment closing costs, you have to prove that you have the money. You can't just show up and say, uh, yeah, I have the money. Don't worry about it. <laughs> as someone once said to me, they were like, uh, don't worry about it. Like, no, that's the job of a mortgage lender. They have to know where the money is coming from. Uh, so this is verified most of the time through two months worth of bank statements. So your lender is going to ask you for two uh, previous months of your bank statements as well. Um, and then anything that is more than 1% of the purchase price as a deposit uh, is what's considered a large deposit. Okay. So again, if we're looking at a $425,000 home, anything that is above, let's say $4,000 is going to be flagged as a large deposit. And the lender needs to source any non-payroll deposits that are these over 1% of the purchase price. Um, and they can actually ask for things that are less than that. Basically, what they want to do is see if there's any non-payroll deposits. Uh, where, where did that money come from? Because on FHA loans, you can't use things like you know a personal loan or a credit card. You can't use unsecured loans uh, to fund your down payment and closing costs. You can, however, use things like, uh, you know, your 401k or, you know, maybe a home equity line of credit from real estate or any sort of secured uh, loan you can use there. Um, and I know this can be kind of frustrating, but really what ended up happening is the Patriot Act is what requires lenders to look at bank statements for evidence of money laundering and evidence of terrorism. Um, and then, of course, they also want to make sure that the money didn't come from borrowed sources, because to a lender, in their mind, if you need a credit card to pay your down payment, then they probably don't want to issue a loan because in their mind, they're thinking, well, if you can't pay the down payment, how are you going to pay all the other costs and the monthly payment for the home? And so that can be kind of frustrating. But ultimately, any of those kind of large deposits do need to be sourced. If you're selling things, let's say you sell a car and you get $5,000, you can document the receipt of that sale and use that money. That's perfectly fine. Also, um, you can get down payment assistance from family. If you're so lucky, that your family has money and they're willing to help you out, which a lot of people are not in that situation. But if that's the case, your family is allowed to give you a secured or unsecured loan for the down payment, but not the closing costs. Okay. You could also get a gift from a family member if they're even more generous and they're saying, we'll give you money and you don't have to pay us back. Uh, you can get a gift and that can be used for the down payment or and or closing costs. Um, cash on hand is technically allowed in the FHA guidelines, but you have to document it so specifically um, that most underwriters will not allow cash on hand. Again, even though it's in the guidelines, this is an overlay that a lot of lenders have where if they just see a deposit in your account for, let's say, $5,000 and you're like, it was cash I've been saving, uh, most of the time you're not going to be able to use that for your down payment or closing costs. Okay. Crypto must be liquidated and in an account for 60 days. Uh, FHA has not really caught up to the whole cryptocurrency world um, and is still a little bit outdated. Now, the one kind of way around a lot of these rules is by seasoning your funds for over 60 days. So basically what it means when, when money is seasoned, it means it's been, been sitting in your bank account for over 60 days. Because again, the underwriter is going to look at uh, 60 days worth of bank statements. So two full months worth of bank statements. If we have money, let's say we have cash on hand. Okay, let's say I have $5,000 cash and I want to buy a loan in maybe four months. It's better for me to go ahead and put that money into my account right now because then four months is going to pass. When I apply for my loan, an underwriter is going to ask for the past two months. An underwriter doesn't ask about a beginning balance on an account. They do look at the deposits though. So if that money is already in the account before the seasoning happened, before they looked at those statements, then it doesn't get questioned. If those deposits happen within those two months, it will get questioned. Okay. So that is something that you can use if you have something like cash on hand uh, that you want to be able to use. Now, to lower these costs, the down payment and the closing costs, we can ask for what's called a seller credit. This is also called a seller concession. Um, and what this means is we can ask for up to 6% of the purchase price uh, towards our closing costs. So, for instance, um, we'll actually run through an example here in a second. 
So seller credits can make your offer less attractive. That's really important to keep in mind here is because what's happening is let's say we're offering, you know, we were looking to buy a $425,000 home and we're like, man, we love this home, uh, but we need money for closing costs. And then we ask the seller, hey, could you pay us money for our closing costs? Well, the seller is going to walk away with less money. So often what you'll want to do um, is work with a realtor who can help you negotiate this, where you might actually raise the purchase price and then ask for that money as a credit back. Effectively, what you're doing is you're financing your closing costs in that way, right? So for instance, let's say the home is $425,000 and we want $5,000 back in closing costs. We can actually offer $430,000 asking for a $5,000 credit. To the seller, there's really no difference. They're making the same amount of money net. To us, we get $5,000. We just kind of financed it into the home purchase, okay? So here's a quick example. Let's say we're looking at a purchase price of $425,000. The down payment is $14,875. Let's estimate closing costs around $6,500. And let's say we ask for 1% of a seller credit. That's 1% of 425 is $4,250. So the down payment plus the closing costs minus the seller credit would give us a total due at closing of $17,175. Now you don't have to be too overwhelmed by the math here. If you work with a really solid realtor who understands how this works and also understands more about FHA loans, um, they can really help you uh, figure out what number do you need down here to do the math for these numbers up here. Um, so if you'd like to be connected and get a referral for a fantastic real estate all throughout the nation, you can go to homeandmoney.com slash Kyle, uh, fill out a couple questions, and they'll connect you with one of the best realtors uh, in your area. Okay, so now credit score requirements with FHA loans. Uh, every person, well, most people have three credit scores, one with uh, Equifax, one with Experian, and one with TransUnion, Okay. Now, FHA does allow loans if you don't have a credit score. We'll get to that. It's called manual underwriting. Um, but for most people, they're going to be running into this situation. What lenders going to do on an FHA loan is actually look at your middle credit score. So we're going to find our highest and we're going to cut that out. We're going to find the lowest and we're going to cut that out. 647 is what we would use on this FHA loan. So 647, that's above 580. So we can do 3.5% down. Also, the 647 is going to control our interest rate. The higher our credit score is, the lower the interest rate is. The lower our credit score is, the higher the interest rate is. Okay. So middle score here. Um, with FHA loans, let's look at a couple different brackets. So 500, that's the minimum for FHA. Now we offer loans all the way down to a 500 credit score with FHA. A lot of lenders don't. They have overlays where they might bring it up to 640. We work with over 80 different lenders and a lot of them offer uh, down to a 500 credit score, which again, you can reach out to us and we'd love to help. Um, 580 is more accepted and easier to get approved. Okay. Again, that's because a lot of these overlays, a lot of lenders will kind of put their bare minimum at 580 because they don't want to do those 500 to 579 loans because they can be a little bit more difficult to do and take a little bit longer. 640 is what's most accepted with a lot of lenders. You'll find 640 being kind of the bare minimum for a lot of people. Um, you know, I've made a lot of videos on FHA before talking about the minimum credit score. And a lot of people will say, I can't find 500. I can only find people doing down to 640. Um, and that's because of those overlays. Again, we work with lenders all the way down to a 500 credit score. You can reach out to us when the house you love.com. Uh, 680. So when we start getting into higher credit scores, anything above a 680, I don't know that an FHA loan is going to be the best strategy for you. Again, FHA loan is something that I think you're only going to hold on to for a short period of time and then refinance into something more cost effective like a conventional loan. Um, so if you have anywhere between a 620 credit score and a 680 credit score, I think it's worth getting a quote for conventional and FHA. However, if you have above 680, there's really not a ton of reason to get an FHA loan unless you have a really high debt. Um, that would be really the only main benefit of getting an FHA uh, loan. And there is no maximum on FHA. So again, you can have an 800 score and still qualify for an FHA loan. Um, so this is one of the most lenient types or major types of loans um, in here uh, compared to, you know, uh, conventional VA, USDA. Um, and again, if you're in between a 620 and a 680, also look at a conventional loan to compare those two. 
um, because in between 620 and 680 credit score is where it kind of can go back and forth on which loan is going to be better for you. Uh, for some people, maybe at a 620 score, FHA is going to be better, even if you can qualify for conventional. Um, or if you're at a 680, conventional might be better, even though you might still qualify for an FHA loan. And so what I really recommend to a lot of people is, you know, if you're really wanting to buy a house and you're, you're like, I really need to get out of my current situation and get into a home and you have a lower credit score, FHA can be a great option, you know, in this range. Um, I think what's going to be best, though, is if you're in the 580, 640 or higher range to get an FHA loan, um, 640 really is kind of the sweet spot for getting approved for an FHA loan, 640 and higher. So if you're in that spot and you're like, you know, I actually want to do a little bit of work on my credit. Um, you can go to scoremaster.com slash Kyle. And in here uh, is a really cool way to get to your best credit score. So this is what I use to track my credit score as well. Um, and through using this software, uh, there's an average 61 point score increase uh, in 20 days. And so it shows you different simulations on what you could pay down or actions you could take in your credit score um, to be able to boost it. Uh, so that's in the description as well. So let's talk about one of the big lender problems here is not all lenders have the ability to do the bare minimum FHA guidelines. In this video, we're talking about bare minimum FHA guidelines, which we have lenders who can do those. But a lot of lenders do have what are called overlays. Okay. And yeah, this is what we're, we were talking about. 500 is the minimum credit score, but a lot of lenders, they'll raise that for themselves. It doesn't mean that's the rule for FHA across the board. It just means that's the rule with that one specific lender. So you can talk with other lenders who might go down to the minimum uh, lending guidelines like we do. Also, just because you're eligible doesn't mean you're going to get approved. We're going to talk about the two different underwriting methods in an upcoming slide. Um, but a lot of times people will say, oh, I have a 540 credit score. So this means I can, I can get a loan automatically. It doesn't. It just means that you're eligible. You still have to go through the underwriting process. Um, and there are other requirements than just the credit score to get approved. FHA is not just, oh, you have this credit score, here's a loan. That's not how it works. There's multiple levels um, of different risk analysis to see if you're approved for a loan. This is just for eligibility, okay? So if you're down to a 500 credit score, uh, you know, anywhere in between 800 to 500, you're eligible for an FHA loan. You still have to go through the other approval requirements. Now, let's talk about some credit events. A lot of people use FHA loans because there was something that happened to their credit. There was a bankruptcy, there was a foreclosure, there was a short sale, there was an IRS lien. There was something in there and other loans like conventional loans do not like those. So the waiting times for FHA is a lot shorter uh, related to those credit events. So first, FHA is more forgiving on revolving and installment lates than a lot of other loans. Conventional loans, really, even though the minimum is 620 as a credit score, conventional loans really like 680 credit scores and higher. And they really prefer things in the 700s and higher. Um, and conventional loans can be difficult get a, to get approved for if you do have some of these recent late payments. Um, so on FHA, non-medical collections greater than $2,000 uh, total require a payment plan. They're required to be paid off or 5% of the balance must be included in the debt to income ratio. So if you do have any non-medical collections, again, FHA doesn't care about um, medical collections, any non-medical collections, then it needs to be one of these three things. So for instance, if you have a $5,000 collection, $250 per month has to be included in your debt to income ratio. I have a whole slide on debt to income ratio that we'll cover, and this changes your affordability. So this means that you would qualify for um, you know, $250 per month less in a potential future home. Um, so for a lot of people, that's going to be really tough. For other people, that's not going to be a problem at all. And you can strategize with your loan officer on, okay, do I need to get the balance in there or do, can I pay it off or can I get a payment plan? What's going to be the best strategy with collections? Also, um, what's really been really interesting is the Biden administration has uh, taken loans that have been uh, delinquent and kind of given them what they call a fresh start. So they took them out of delinquency and out of a credit reporting system called CAVERS, which logs all federal debt. So if you have a federal student loan, um, likely that was reset and taken out of default if it was previously in default. Um, which can really help you with an FHA uh, loan. Now, one big note in here is even though FHA is lenient on these things, um, they still affect your credit score. So bankruptcy still affects your credit score, which then affects your approval for an FHA loan. So even though they're lenient on them, uh, 
your credit score can still tank because of things like collections. Like, you know, FHA doesn't care about medical collections, but if you have a ton of medical collections, that will lower your score and lower your odds of getting approved. Okay, um, so we covered medical collections. Let's walk through some of the waiting times here. So if you had a deed in lieu of foreclosure, a foreclosure, or a short sale, then you're going to have to wait um, three years from the transfer of that to get an FHA loan. If you had a chapter seven, two years from the discharge of that. If you have a chapter 13, there's two different options you can take. Um, the first one is with a manually underwritten loan, um, and this is 12 months on-time payments uh, and a court approval to be able to qualify. Uh, then the second option is through the automated underwriting system, and that's two years from the discharge. If you have an IRS lien, then you need three on-time payments that are also included in your debt-to-income ratio, which can affect your uh, future affordability. Okay. So now FHA rates. FHA rates are often lower than conventional rates. They're similar to USDA rates. Uh, uh, VA loans tend to be lower as well. Now, even though the rate is lower on conventional, uh, you do have that offset with FHA's kind of more expensive mortgage insurance, which I'm going to cover here in an upcoming slide. Um, again, I know I keep saying that, but if you watch the whole video, everything's going to start to make sense when it all comes uh, together. Easier than conventional uh, to get lender credits if desired. Since the rate can be lower on an FHA loan, what you can do is actually ask your loan officer, if you want to, to raise the uh, interest rate. When they do that, they can give you a credit back towards your closing costs if you need it. Now, the opposite is true. You can ask your lender to lower your interest rate, and then you can actually pay upfront money, uh, kind of think of it like prepaid interest, to lower your interest rate. Um, you can also get a fixed rate loan, meaning that it's not going to change for, let's say, 15, 20, 30 years, however long you get your FHA loan for. You can also get an adjustable rate loan. And the way that this works is there's a fixed period and then an adjustable period. So for instance, a 5-1 adjustable rate mortgage is common, a 5-1 arm. So that means the first five years are fixed. And then the rest of the loan can change in its interest rate every single year, depending on what happens in the market. You can also get a temporary buy down. This is often uh, called a 2-1 a buy down or a permanent buy down. A temporary buy down is where the first, let's say, two years of the loan have a lower interest rate. This is funded by seller credits. A permanent buy down is where you prepay money up front to lower the interest rate for the entire life of the loan. And if you want to take a look at today's interest rates, you can go to winthehouseyoulove.com slash rates, and I chart out all the different uh interest rates and compare them to other types of loans. Now, mortgage insurance, this is the big kicker with FHA loans. This is why a lot of people are kind of afraid of FHA is primarily because there's two mortgage insurance types added to every single FHA loan. The first one is uh, the upfront mortgage insurance premium. Okay. So this is 1.75% of the loan amount added to the loan amount. Most people don't pay this out of pocket. It's included in the loan balance. I'll get to an example right here. Then you also have the mortgage insurance premium. This is monthly and it's 0.85% of your loan amount. Now, the reason a lot of people don't like uh, FHA loans and the reason why I only suggest FHA loans as a bridge, which I'll tell you more about the bridge strategy near the end of this video, is because the mortgage insurance is going to stay on for the entire life of the loan. If you get a 30-year loan, you're going to have mortgage insurance on there monthly for 30 years. Okay. Um, compared to something like a conventional loan, that mortgage insurance drops off when you have about 20% equity. Uh, you also, on every loan, have this upfront mortgage insurance as well. One little caveat here with the monthly mortgage insurance on FHA loans is if you put 10% or more as a down payment, FHA mortgage insurance will fall off after 11 years. Otherwise, if you put less than 10% down, it will stay on for the entire life of the loan. So for instance, let's say we're looking at a $300,000 loan. FHA's upfront mortgage insurance would be $5,250, meaning our new loan balance would be $305,250. Okay, you're not paying it out, out of pocket. It's included in your loan amount. Then your monthly payment would be $212.50 per month just in the mortgage insurance cost. All right. Now, this does decrease uh, every single year, but you're going to expect to budget around $212 per month 
just for that mortgage insurance during the first year. And this is going to be charged by your lender. So you don't have to like separate, uh, you know, pay this separately. It's going to be included in your loan. So monthly payment as well. Again, this is an educational scenario. Everything in this video is an educational uh, scenario. So $400,000 purchase price. Let's say we're doing three and a half percent down as the minimum. And let's say we're getting a 6.125% interest rate. Our principal and interest would be around $2,400. Uh, tax, let's estimate around $520. Uh, homeowner's insurance, around $150. The mortgage insurance premium, $272. And you can see how all of this added together brings you to a monthly payment of around $3,300. The best way to get an estimate of this quote um, is just reach out to us. We'd love to give you a free home loan consult. We can walk you through all these decision-making numbers that you need to know. Things like your interest rate, how much money you need down, how much you qualify for, and then a breakdown of all of your monthly payment as well. So some property requirements in here. Um, FHA is only for a primary residence. Okay, This is not for investment properties. There is a way to do what's called a house hacking um, where we can kind of uh, use it a little bit as an investment property, um, which I will cover. You can use this on a two to four unit home where you live in one unit and then rent out the others. And you ultimately want to work with the right real estate agent because FHA can be a little tricky when you're looking at putting in offers. Number one, we need to make sure that we find an FHA eligible home. Okay. Also, we need somebody who's familiar with the process and we need somebody who can help us negotiate with that FHA loan. When a seller looks at us and says, oh, it's an FHA loan, is this going to close? We need a realtor who can help communicate why this is going to be a good offer for the seller to accept. And again, if you're looking for a real estate agent referral, you can go to homeandmoney.com slash Kyle uh, right over here. Okay, so some property requirements um, in here. People get this confused quite a bit. So first, you have to move into the home within 60 days. So after you close on the home, uh, you need to be able to move into it. And this is to prevent uh, you know, investors from saying, oh, well, I'll move into the home eventually, and then they never do, and then they rent it out, and then they took advantage of an FHA loan. Um, the minimum occupancy time to rent out the home is one year, okay? So this is where you can kind of take advantage of an FHA loan to use it as a kind of a, a little bit as an investment of sorts. It's not an investment property um, in the beginning. So this is the way it works. You can close on the home, live in it for one year, and then you can decide to move out rent it without refinancing your loan. If let's say you bought the home and then you want to move out and rent it out within six months, you have to refinance into an investment loan that has a much higher interest rate and a much higher uh, equity requirement, meaning you're probably going to have to bring money to the closing table to refinance. With FHA, as long as you live in it for a year, you can then rent it out. Now, when it comes to selling, you can sell it anytime. There's no repercussions there. So you can buy your FHA home and then you can actually choose to sell it within three months and then buy another home with FHA if you want to. It's only when you decide to rent it out that you have to be in there for a year. Otherwise, you need to refinance into investment. If you don't, that's called mortgage fraud. And I promise they will catch up to you. <laughs> okay, condos. So most people with FHA tend to buy single family homes that are detached, uh, you know, have a little yard with them. However, you can buy a condo. Um, but they can be a little bit tricky with FHA loans. So the condo association has to be approved. And the reason that FHA requires this is they want to make sure that the home value is going to be stable. Um, because in a condo, your home value also depends on uh, uh, the other units in the condo, the condo building itself, and uh, how uh, stable the condo association is. So FHA has an approved condos list. I'll put a link for uh, that resource where you can look up a certain condo project and see if it's approved. Um, but this can be very difficult to see a condo on that list. There are things with FHA loans called a single unit approval. It's possible, but it's tough. And what ends up happening is this is if you look at for a, a condo project on the list, it's not there, then you can actually see if you can get one of those units FHA approved. Here's all the requirements for it. It's very difficult to do. Um, first, there has to be five or more units to qualify. Less than 10 units uh, if there's less than 10 units, only two can be FHA. If it's greater or equal to 10 units, only 50% can be FHA. Greater than 50% must be owner-occupied. Association must have 10% of HOA budget and cash reserves. Uh, greater than 85% of units must be current on their dues. No more than 35% of property can be a commercial use. And all these details have to be recertified every three years. 
<laughs> it's tough because also condo associations are not easy to work with or get documents from, and the lender has to document all this. So if we're looking at a success rate of a single unit approval, uh, it's only 50%. If you look at FHA's uh, condo approval website, there was about 15,000 approved and 15,000 rejections. Um, in HUD reports, only 6.5% of all available condos in the U.S. would be eligible. So ultimately, if you're looking at a condo, I would say look at the condo approved list. If it's on there, great, you can get an FHA loan with it. If it's not on there, single unit approval is an option, but it's going to be extremely difficult to do. Um, and what's frustrating is usually you're already putting earnest money on the home. Uh, likely you've done home inspection because it takes a long time most of the time for the condo association to get all these documents back to you and for an underwriter to review them. If I were you, if you're looking at a condo and it's not on the condo approved list, I would try to qualify for a conventional loan. And you can talk to a loan officer on, hey, this is what I want to do. If I can't qualify for a conventional loan now, can you help me get on the right strategy to qualify for a conventional loan in the future? House hacking. This is one of the most uh, attractive things about an FHA loan is because the guidelines are so lenient um, and because the down payment is so low for these two to four unit homes, uh, house hacking is a really smart strategy. I had a friend who just recently did this. Um, he has a really high credit score. He has pretty uh, decent income compared to the amount of debts that he has. And he was like, I want to buy a four unit home. I want to live in one. I want to rent out the others and make it work. And uh, initially, because he has a, a low credit age, he's only had a credit history for the past you know, couple of years, he wouldn't be able to get approved for a conventional loan. Um, he put all, all the stuff we put through the automated underwriting software and it, he wasn't able to get approved. However, since FHA is more lenient on lower credit history, he was able to get approved FHA. Um, another benefit of doing this house hacking is you can still do 3.5% down even on a four unit property, on a three unit property, on a two unit property. Compared to conventional, it's going to require 15 to 25% down. So this is really popular for people getting into their first home along with their first investment. Uh, you know, it's not technically an investment property, but their first investment property because you can do 3.5% down up to a four unit home. You can use that other income from the other units to help you qualify for the loan as well compared to a conventional loan that's going to have maybe a 25% down payment, which a lot of first time home buyers can't afford. Um, so you can use 75% of the future rental income to help you qualify for this loan. So that would be from the other units. Um, also, FHA does have this, what's called a self-sufficiency test. Anything that's a three to four unit home um, basically says 70% of future rental income must ex exceed the mortgage payment. Um, and then usually you need three months of reserves in your bank account after you close. That means that uh, if your mortgage payment is, uh, for easy math, $2,000 per month, after you pay your down payment and closing costs, you need to have uh, $6,000 left in your account as a reserve kind of emergency fund. Um, another strategy that kind of is in the house hacking realm is just a move up strategy. And the way that this would work is you can buy a home. Let's say it's a single family home. Um, you live in it for a year. And then you go and buy another primary residence home. You move out of your current home, you rent it out, and you go move into another home. You don't have to refinance it into an investment. Um, because the main uh, restriction to getting into investment properties is the down payment requirement that a lot of people run into. So you could buy your first home 3.5% down on an FHA loan, live in it for a year, go buy another house, rent out your current one without having to refinance and collect rental income on that. You can do this same thing with the two to four unit home. You can live in it for a year and then you can go buy another house. Go, getting another multifamily with FHA is going to be really difficult, but you can go buy another primary residence, uh, maybe with a conventional loan and then rent out uh, the unit that you're in. So maybe you now have four occupied units with FHA. Really common strategy um, and really great way to utilize an FHA loan. Property condition. So. FHA appraisals stick with the property for four months. So uh, if a buyer, uh, let's say you're looking at a home and there was actually a buyer on the property before you and maybe uh, a month ago they got an appraisal and then that fell through for some reason and then you come in, you actually have to use the value from their appraisal. So that appraisal 
sticks with that home for four months, no matter who the buyer is. Okay. Um, now what you can do is actually, so you can transfer this in if a buyer had a previous appraisal with it. So sometimes this can be a little bit of an issue every once in a while where, you know, that might've happened where a buyer before you looked to buy the home you're buying the value, you know, maybe came in fine, but for whatever reason, they couldn't buy the home, uh, you know, underwriting fell through or something happened. Um, but you do still have to have that value for the next uh, or for that period of four months. FHA is primarily concerned with what's called health and safety. I'm going to cover all the guidelines here in just a second. So anything that's structurally sound, think move in ready with FHA loans. Uh, foreclosures are going to be tough with FHA, um, primarily because they usually have some issues that they, that need to be worked on. Um, and this is where you do want to work with a good realtor. You don't want to just put in an offer and put earnest money down and pay for an inspection uh, and get an appraisal and spend, you know, maybe a thousand dollars up front in inspection and appraisal and maybe any earnest money. Uh, all for it to not qualify for FHA. Uh, because what you can do then is in your post-inspection uh, agreement with a seller is actually request the seller to fix things that might not be up to FHA standards, but it does put your deal uh, in jeopardy. There can be a risk of that deal falling through. Um, so you do want to work with a good real estate agent who can help you negotiate those things up front, spot those things up front so they don't become an issue. I can't tell you how many times um, you know, we've done an FHA loan and the realtor thinks, oh yeah, this is no problem at all. Or they don't check. And, you know, as, as loan officers, we don't, we can't go and walk through the house and, <laughs> and inspect it. Uh, so the, the realtor really needs to be, um, helping you understand if this house can qualify for FHA or not. Um, and they can ask the loan officer, like, can you give me some tips and guidelines on what to look out for? Um, but the amount of times that an appraisal comes back and then it's just, there'll be wiring, open wiring hanging down, or there'll be a busted window or even simple things like a, a handrail isn't installed on stairs. These are all easy fixes and things that should be done before an FHA appraiser goes out there. Those are really easy things to negotiate in your contract upfront by working with a good real estate agent, by working with a good loan officer who can help you help your real estate, under, real estate agent understand these things. That way it doesn't delay the process and you have to pay for uh, a secondary appraisal inspection and the whole deal just becomes annoying. So <laughs> just something to keep in mind. Um, also, FHA appraisals are stricter than conventional because they are government insured. Um, FHA does insure the payments to investors for FHA loans. And so again, that's why they want the homes to be uh, really kind of more move and ready. They don't want there to be issues in the event that uh, they need to foreclose and sell on the uh, sell the home. So appraisal highlights in here, I'm going to cover all these things that your real estate agent should be looking out for. And, and you can look out for these things as well um, if you if you would like to, or you can just send this list over to your real estate agent. The first thing is that FHA loans have what's called an amendatory clause. So you're gonna sign your contract on your home to say, hey, we wanna purchase this house for you know this amount of money, here's all the details. But then after that, uh, your lender is gonna send you a document called an amendatory clause that you need to sign and the seller needs to sign. And the amendatory clause says that when the appraisal happens, if the appraisal comes in below uh, the purchase price, so let's say the purchase price is four hundred thousand dollars, and the appraisal comes in at let's say three fifty, if that happens, you're allowed to exit the deal, and you're allowed to take your earnest money with you. People get this very confused <laughs> um, because, especially in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of like appraisal contingency uh, waivers. Um, there's also been uh, a lot of appraisal gaps where people are basically saying if the appraisal comes in short then uh, the seller has the leverage and the buyer either has to pay or lose their earnest money. And uh, no matter what your contract says, the amendatory clause is the rule of law with an FHA loan. And the reason why is because even if on your contract, you say if the appraisal comes in short, we'll cover the difference. The amendatory clause gets signed after the contract. It is the thing that rules what happens with the value of your home and your earnest money if the appraisal comes in short, no matter what your contract says, if the seller signs the amendatory clause after the purchase contract is signed, um, then you are allowed to leave the contract, exit the contract and take your earnest money with you if the value comes in short. So you do have this really nice protection in here. The seller doesn't have to sign it, but that means you won't be able to get an FHA loan. The seller has to sign this to get an FHA loan. Um, okay. So some really quick uh, highlights here, some things to watch out for. If you're looking through a home and you want to write an offer with an FHA loan, um, the roof 
uh, needs to have two years of economic life remaining. No exposed electrical wiring. Why are people selling homes with exposed electrical wiring? I, I can't tell you a lot of times. <laughs> I've seen an appraisal. And there's just open wiring hanging. Just It's not that hard to cover it. I don't, I, I don't know. That's a pet peeve of mine. Um, sellers, if you're selling a house, just cover your electrical wiring. It's not hard. Uh, appliances, uh, if they're being conveyed with the property, they need to be operational. If you're getting an oven and a fridge with the property, it needs to be operational. Um, handrails are not needed if their uh, if their absence doesn't pose a safety threat. Um, this is, can be a difficult one because it can be kind of subjective. Really, uh, what I've seen is anything that has three steps or more uh, needs to have a handrail on at least one side. Um, you can even get away with uh, a temporary handrail that's just some two by fours, uh, really solidly screwed in. That is absolutely an option. You don't have to build something nice and ornate. Um, stairway down to the basement needs at least one handrail. Uh, no standing water on the site near the foundation. The attic must be accessible. If it's not, the appraiser is not going to move things out of the way to access the home. The seller needs to make it ready to be accessible by an appraiser. Um, a spec pest inspection is only required if the current or past infestation is evident. Um, the property line cannot be located within 300 feet of an above ground or subsurface stationary storage tank with a capacity of 1,000 gallons or more of flammable or explosive material. Um, this is more common for people if they want to buy a home right next to a gas station, uh, which is surprisingly um, somewhat common. Uh, if it's built before 1978, there can be no chipped or peeling paint on interior or exterior of the home. If it's built after 1978, the exterior defective paint that expo exposes subsurface must be repaired. Um, and this is, uh, you know, these two rules um, are because of lead-based paint. Uh, broken window glass needs to be replaced, while cracked glass does not. Okay, so let's run through some example homes. Sometimes it's helpful to run through some you know, real life scenarios. So I pulled some of these uh, off of Zillow. And this is all, you know, public data here. All the costs and payments are just averages um, in here. So this is in Fresno, California, listed for $410,000. Um, so in here, if we did 3.5% down, that'd be $14,350. I'm going to estimate closing costs around $8,200. Okay. We could ask for a 1% seller credit. That'd be $4,100. That means our down payment plus our closing costs minus the seller credit gives us a total due at closing of $18,450. Now let's assume we got this loan with a 6.125% rate. That would give us a principal and interest payment of $2,446 per month. Mortgage insurance would be around $280 per month. Now the rest of these numbers are going to be averages specific to the property. Taxes on this home are around $300. HO uh, homeowner's insurance, HOI, um, is really going to be more specific to you, but estimate around $144 and there was no HOA here. So the total bill from the mortgage company per month on this home would probably be around $3,169. Of course, you still have utilities that you do need to pay, but those aren't mortgage costs. This is what's going to be the mortgage cost that the lender would uh, give you a bill for every month. Okay. Let's run through another one. This is in Manor, Texas. Uh, I think it's how you say that. Manor, Manor, probably. Uh, just under $500,000. Uh, so again, 3.5% down, $17,325. Estimate closing costs, $9,900. And then on this, let's say we ask for 1.5% seller credit. So 1.5% of the purchase price towards our closing costs. Um, so down payment plus closing costs minus the seller credit is $19,800. Again, let's say we have a 6.125% rate. Our principal and interest payment would be just shy of $3,000. Mortgage insurance premium would be $337. And then again, the rest of these numbers are estimates based on the home. So property taxes, for whatever reason on this home, are really high uh, at $800. Uh, homeowner's insurance, around $173. That would give us a total of $4,282 per month to buy a home like this. Now, if you're looking at homes that are much less than that, uh, then of course your numbers are going to be lower. If you're looking at a home that hum numbers are much higher, uh, then the numbers would be higher as well. One thing to keep in mind is FHA has loan limits 
in here, which I'm going to cover in just a sec. You can buy a home that is much more expensive than the loan limit, but your loan can't exceed that amount. You have to bring a down payment higher than the difference. Okay. So let's talk about these loan limits. The loan limits change based on the amount of units that you have and if it's in a normal area or a high cost of living area. So this is how this works. If we're getting, let's say, a one unit home, which is common for most people, uh, this scenario is going to be what most people run into of the loan limit being $472,030. All right. If you're in a high cost of living area, this goes all the way up to just over a million dollars. So think somewhere like San Francisco, Sacramento, Nashville, Miami. These are going to be high cost of living areas, and that changes uh, the loan limit for FHA. Um, and I do have a link for the loan limit lookup tool in the description where you can type in the county or city that you're in or looking to buy in, and it will show you the loan limit. Um, then if we get to two units, three units, and four units, you can see how that changes along with high cost as well. So the way that you then find your max purchase price based on the loan amount is by taking the loan limit. So in this instance, let's run with the, you know, what most people are going to run into $472,030. Divide that by 0.965. We got that number from uh, one minus 3.5% down. It's the opposite. Uh, so this is the total loan amount gives you $489,150. So the max that we could buy with a one unit home for most of the US with an FHA loan would be $489,150. After 3.5% down, we would have a loan of four seventy two thirty. dollars Okay. And uh, you can kind of do the difference here. Let's say you want to buy a million dollar home. You can buy a million dollar home with an FHA loan in most of the US. But you're going to need to do a million dollars minus 472,030. That's going to be your down payment. You can still get a loan for 472, but that's going to be the maximum with FHA in most areas. All right. Now, income and affordability. Again, you still have to qualify for an FHA loan. Just, just because you have a certain credit score doesn't mean you're automatically going to get it. So you need a two-year stable history of employment. Now, this doesn't mean you have to have any certain set length of time at a specific job. A lot of people interpret this as, I need to have two years at one job in one position. Absolutely not true. Just a two-year history. A lender needs to see over the past two years, what jobs have you done? What income have they had? Is it stable? Um, is it trending upwards? Does it look like it's going to continue in the future? So it's ideal if it's in a similar field, um, if you are changing jobs. This is very common, you know, especially with uh, COVID recently. Um, there were a lot of people who changed jobs to different hospitals. And they were still employed as maybe a nurse in multiple hospitals with similar income or income that was increasing, but it was all within the same field. And that's the most help. Um, you can get approved for an FHA loan if you're changing jobs in multiple fields, but it becomes more and more difficult when you do that. An underwriter wants to start looking at, okay, do you have certifications for these new jobs? Um, is there consistency in these new jobs or these new fields? It becomes a little more tricky when you start working in a bunch of different uh, fields. Um, retirement and school do count. Uh, so let's say um, you're starting as starting a job as a new nurse and you just went through four years of nursing school. That counts as your stable employment um, getting onto the job. So you don't have to have two years as a nurse. Your college will count. And often an underwriter will ask for your college transcripts just to verify uh, that you have that. Or if you're starting in a new line of work, a new field, an underwriter might ask for certain certifications that you have um, to see if that can help you qualify for the stability of your employment. Retirement counts as well. Um, so even though it's not like a employment necessarily, it's kind of, that's what they view it as. Um, so you can qualify for an FHA loan if you just are on social security income and pension income, and maybe you have a side job. Retirement is perfectly fine. If you have a six month gap or greater, then you need to have six months on the job or more. Okay. That's one of the big rules here with job gaps. Non-taxable income, so things like social security income, can be grossed up by 115%. Um, this is because non-taxable income obviously isn't taxed, and lenders look at gross income, pre-tax income, to qualify you for a loan. So uh, let's say you make $2,500 a month in social security. We multiply that times 1.15, and you would qualify for $2,875 per month as your uh, affordability income. Lenders would then use that to see how much of a home you could afford. 
Um, and I'll get to the debt to income ratio here in just a second. There's no minimum or maximum income limits on these. However, there often are income limits on down payment assistance programs if you add it onto the FHA loan. Um, and then if you're self-employed, two years tax returns average is what's most common for most people. So lenders do look at gross pre-tax income. Um, you, when you're looking at your own budget and affordability of how much you can afford, of course, you're not going to look at pre-tax income. You're going to look at your take-home pay. But lenders look at pre-tax income because net income gets adjusted too much by things like 401ks or maybe there's garnishments or there's other different things pulled out of your uh, paycheck. So they look at pre-tax income. Um, here are the, the limits on what's called a debt to income ratio. So debt to income ratio is what FHA loans use to see how much house you can afford. So when you go to a lender and they're like, hey, you qualify for $300,000, they're not just pulling it out of the air. They're using a mathematical formula called a debt to income ratio. And this is where you take your total monthly debts divided by your total monthly gross income, and that gives a ratio, and it needs to be under a certain limit. And there's two of these ratios to make it even more complex. Uh, the front end is just your potential mortgage payment, okay? Your future mortgage payment you want to qualify for. The maximum that can be is 46.99%. Now, that's only available for people who have a really high credit score. And this all depends on what the underwriting software says. So these are the absolute maximums, but a lot of people don't qualify for the absolute maximum, okay? This is just the absolute maximum you may see if you have a really high credit score. If you have a lower credit score, those maximums are going to get shrunk. Uh, the back end is going to be your future mortgage payment plus any other monthly debts you have, like a car loan, student loans, credit cards. It does not include expenses. Things like groceries, gas, utilities are not included. Um, so your monthly minimum debt payments plus your future mortgage payment cannot exceed 57% of your monthly gross income. You can see that's very high, right? The FHA allows you to go up very, very high um, in your uh, what a loan, the maximum loan you can get. So not everyone can get approved this high. Um, also, if you're getting a manually underwritten loan, then it's going to be much lower. I'm going to explain manual versus automated underwriting in a second. And if you're in a community property state, so Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, uh, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin, um, community property states mean that your if you have a spouse, uh, their debts have to be included in your debt to income ratio as well. Okay. They can be on the loan if you want them to include their income, but even if they're not on the loan, their debts have to be included because of the laws of community property in those states. Okay. So let's run through an example. Let's say you're looking to buy a house with you and your spouse, or maybe they're not your spouse. Maybe they're just a partner. Maybe they're just whomever to you. Let's say that you make $65,000 per year in your gross income. Let's say they make $45,000 per year in your gross income. Do the, you can do the math for your own situation too. We can also help you do this as well if you would like. Uh, so combined, you make $9,166 in gross income per month. So let's say that you have a $450 per month car payment and $250 per month student loans. Let's say they have a credit card for $250, student loans for $400, and child support for $150. Yes, that is child support and alimony is technically a debt in the mortgage world. So the maximum that you get on the front end would be $4,300. The max on the back end would be $3,700. Lenders would then take the lower number. This would be the maximum, absolute maximum you could qualify for with an FHA loan. So you can also have a co-signer or a co-borrower on an FHA loan. Both are allowed. Um, the difference is who is going to be on title. A co-signer is on the mortgage and is fully responsible for the mortgage, just as you are. They just don't have ownership on the title of the home. A co-borrower is responsible on the mortgage just the same, but they do have ownership on the title. Personally, I think that if you're ever going to sign for somebody on a mortgage, that you need to have ownership on the title. I think it's really dumb, personal preference, to sign up for a debt and have no stake in the collateral of the home. Um, that's just my own personal opinion. Um, FHA allows what's called a non-occupying co-borrower, and this is a really common strategy to help somebody qualify for a loan. And this is primarily done with a relative. So this happens a lot with somebody who maybe tried to qualify for an FHA loan by themselves, but they couldn't qualify for some reason. They could have somebody like uh, a parent or a child 
sign as a co-borrower on the loan with them. Non-occupying means they're not going to live there, but they are going to be on the loan and responsible for the debt with you. And that can help you qualify for a loan. So if you're a relative, uh, so a child, a parent, sibling, grandparent, aunt, uncle, or in-laws, then it's still 3.5% down. If it's a non-relative, FHA puts that all the way up to 25% down. So you can see FHA is not a huge fan of the non-relative, non-occupying co-borrower uh, on a loan. But this is a very common strategy for people who are trying to get approved for a loan and they can't do it on their own. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're a bad person or they won't be able to pay it back. Mortgage rules are strict um, and have all these little nuances to them and not everyone fits in these pretty little boxes. And so sometimes people need help to look better on paper to qualify for a loan. Just because you can't qualify for a loan doesn't mean that you're a bad person and can't pay back money. I see this happen all the time where people are really good at paying their their uh, you know their rent payments or they're really good at covering their bills or you know I, I've talked to a veteran once I feel like he's the best example of this uh, guy's fantastic with his money uh, always pays everything on time has a uh, backup set aside um, uh, you know emergency fund set aside really good with his budget but then he got into a car wreck and got care flighted and had a hundred thousand dollar medical bill well, he didn't have $100,000 and his credit got destroyed. And just because he couldn't qualify for a loan in a traditional way, it doesn't mean that he's a bad person that can't pay back money. So if you, sometimes people add this weird levels of shame to it of, oh, if you need a co-borrower, then you shouldn't get a loan. That's not the case. These guidelines here, like everything in the mortgage world, it's, it's all just kind of made up on what it statistically uh, it looks like for someone to pay back a loan. Just because you don't fit that little box doesn't mean that you're a bad person, doesn't mean that you can't actually pay back a loan. You just might need help looking better on paper uh, to get that loan. Now, I do have um, a tool called the Max Purchase Price Calculator because a lot of this, uh, you know, this all the rules and the calculations around debt to income ratios can be kind of confusing. So I put this together in an Excel document if you would like to use it. Um, so the link is in the description. You can also go to winthehouseyoulove.com slash max price. And what this allows you to do is put in your scenario so what kind of down payment you want, you know, we're looking at FHA, so 3.5 um, interest rate. You can also put in your income and your debts. And what it will do is go through a whole affordability dashboard and show you an estimated max purchase price, uh, estimate of total, your monthly payment, break that down for you as well, um, show you estimated closing costs, gives you different uh, risk levels um, for different payments. So, you know, you could go with a really risky uh, payment. Or you could go with something that's more safe and depends on what you want. But it allows you to explore all of the numbers in here um, and see, you know, estimate of utilities and maintenance costs uh, and even shows you how, uh, where's it at? Shows you how all the math is done um, and then shows you different uh, affordability theories based on people like Dave Ramsey or the 2-6 ratio or qualified mortgage or 30-33 um, by a lot of personal uh, finance gurus. So, winthehouseyoulove.com slash max price. If you don't want to do the math yourself, if you want to know that you're doing it right, uh, you can use that tool. Okay, so now FHA versus other loans. This is one of the four main loan types. There's conventional loans, there's FHA, there's USDA, and there's VA. And of course, there's tons of other different types of loans. Those are the most common that you're going to see here. Um, so if you have a 620 credit score, this is the conventional uh, credit score minimum. So anywhere from a 620 to a 680, uh, I think you should get a conventional loan quote and an FHA loan quote too. Because, you know, just because, uh, let's say you have a 640 credit score, you still might not get approved for a conventional loan. Um, so that's why a lot of people will look at FHA. Now, if you can, if you're in that like 640 range, like 620 to 680, go ahead and get approved for, or try to get approved for a conventional loan and get a quote for that. And try to get approved for an FHA loan and get a quote for that. And then you can compare the two. Talk to your loan officer. Hey, can you walk me through the differences of these two? Which one would be better? For a lot of people, what makes a lot most financial sense is to actually go with the FHA loan, have that, build appreciation in your home, build equity in your home, uh, and then work on your credit. And then let's say two to five years, refinance into a conventional loan so we get cheaper mortgage insurance that will eventually fall off. Um, also consider VA and USDA loans. They also allow down to a 500 credit score and they both have a zero down payment with them. They're not down payment assistance. They just don't have down payments. So VA is for veterans. USDA is only for homes in eligible rural areas and it does have an income limit as well. 
Um, but we can help you with that. You can just go to winthehousefield.com, set up a consultation with us, and we'd love to help show you some of those options. Um, USDA and VA are government loans as well. So they're really flexible when it comes to credit uh, standards and qualifying. They just have a couple other restrictions, like one requires you to be a veteran and the other one requires you to live in certain locations. Um, student loans, this one can be a really big, tricky subject that people are kind of afraid of. A lot of people uh, can still qualify for a mortgage even when having student loans. Sometimes uh, I think the fear is greater than the reality of the situation. So what's a little strange about FHA loans is that when you get one, your profile is going to be checked against what's called CAVERS. And CAVERS is, um, think of it almost like a credit report that the government has for anyone who hasn't paid back federal debt. So if you have a federal student loan and you haven't paid it back, let's say it's delinquent, um, your name is going to be added to the CAVERS database. And it's the whole database the government has to say who has and hasn't paid back federal debt. If you are in the CAVERS database because you haven't paid back federal debt, then you won't be able to get an FHA loan until you're out of CAVERS. Now, it's been interesting as uh, we've seen a lot of the student loan weirdness happening over the past year and kind of the, a lot of in and outs on like there's pausing and is there going to be forgiveness and what's going to happen. Uh, the Biden administration actually restarted CAVERS. So if you were in default for student loans, that was actually pulled out of a default. Um, and so that might be a really good opportunity for you if you were in CAVERS. Uh, there is a current pause on student loans. Uh, through 630 of 2023. And that might change, uh, you know, after this video comes out, this is just as the time of this video. Uh, that's what the current pause is. So FHA loans allow income driven repayments. Um, this says IRD, this should say IDR. <laughs> uh, so income driven repayments are when you're on a program with student loans where it actually lowers your monthly payment with those student loans. And basically what happens is you're allowed to use the income driven repayment to qualify in the debt to income ratio for an FHA loan. So like we talked about with the student loan payments in the debt to income ratio, uh, if you have IDR, that can lower what that payment is, which can help you get approved for more. Um, the only weird caveat here is, uh, you know, let's say you're on income driven repayment and your payment is $100 per month. Then that $100 per month is included in your debt to income ratio, um, which can be a lot better than maybe $500 per month that the normal payment would be. However, if your payment is $0 per month or deferred, then the lender has to use 0.5% of the balance included in the debt to income ratio. So if you have a $50,000 balance in student loans, that would be $250 per month in the debt to income ratio. So this current pause has caused a little bit of uh, some uh, trickiness with FHA loans for people who have really high student loans because their loans are automatically deferred lenders need to use the 0.5% of the balance. Now, what you can do is you can talk to an advisor like uh, someone at like LoanSense, for instance, and I have a link for them down in the description. What they can do is help you uh, get out of deferred status and into an income-driven repayment plan to help bring down that payment. Um, that way you can qualify for more of a mortgage if you want to. Okay, um, so this is how this would work. Uh, you know, If you're deferred and can't qualify, you can get on a government plan, uh, like an income-driven repayment, repayment plan type to avoid the 0.5%. Um, so you can go to winthehouseyoulove.com slash student. There's a little calculator here that would show you how it would reduce your student payments. This is not refinancing your student loans at all. All you're doing is enrolling in a specific type of IDR program to lower that payment, pull you out of deferred status so you can qualify for a loan um, by having a, uh, something included in your debt to income ratio that's less than the 0.5%. So there's two different types of underwriting with FHA loans. There's automated and manual. So the way that automated underwriting works um, is you submit an application into a lender. So that application data is reviewed by a software, okay? And the software is kind of going to give like a thumbs up or a thumbs down and usually give some very cryptic explanations as to why if there was a thumbs down. This is where your loan officer can really help you strategize how can we get the software to give an approval. Um, so after it's put into the software, that data is then verified by a human. And those two primary humans are your loan officer who's going to help you with your application and then also an underwriter. So ultimately, your loan officer is going to take your application, run it through the automated underwriting software, um, which runs through all these rules to see if you qualify for an FHA loan. Then once that's done, an underwriter is going to take a second look 
And basically what they're doing, looking to do is they want to see that if the software uh, has that you make $5,000 per month and is issuing an approval, an underwriter is going to take a look at your pay stubs and your W-2s and your tax returns and see, do you actually make $5,000 per month or do you actually make $3,000 per month? So that's where you have the software plus humans who give you this approval on a loan. Again, it's not just people on the back end being like, well, I think John's a good person, so we're going to give him $300,000. It's not how it works. You submit an application, your loan officer helps you with that, and then the data is verified by a human, both your loan officer and an underwriter. Um, so uh, automated underwriting is the easiest and most common option. When you get into manual underwriting, it takes longer, there's more paperwork, and often there's a higher interest rate associated with it. Lenders like automated underwriting because there's a level of um, confidence that the loan will get approved when it's approved by the software. Uh, now, I'm going to get to this rent history in just a second. This right here is kind of a strategy uh, that a loan officer may use with automated underwriting. So AUS, this is the automated underwriting system. First, what a loan officer would do is submit your application data to the automated underwriting software. And they're going to see, it. does it give a thumbs up or a thumbs down? If it gives a thumbs up, great. You're pre-approved. You can start looking for homes. You get under contract. You move forward with the loan. Great, dandy, super easy. If you don't get approved, a loan officer is going to take a look and see what other strategies can we use to get approved for that loan? Do we need to do things like adding a co-borrower? Do we need to add rental history? Do we need to show that you have more in savings? Do we need to, like, there's all these different strategies to see how we can get the, the software to give you an approval. So one of the easiest ways is to add your rental history to the underwriting software. So for this, you need to have a 620 credit score or higher. You need to be a first time home buyer and you need to have 12 months on time rental history. If that's the case, your rental history can be added into the underwriting software and that can help nudge your approval in the right direction. Where maybe you got a thumbs down, the rental history now turns your approval into a thumbs up. If it's still thumbs down and a loan officer might suggest looking into adding a co-borrower, again, someone like a family member who could sign on the loan with you. If that doesn't work or if that's not an option, because for a lot of people that's not an option, um, then might be looking at working on credit. Like what are other things on your application that you can do to help your approval? Your loan officer can help strategize this with you. Um, so this is where often credit work is usually needed um, to see maybe in the next three months, can we nudge this approval in the right direction by clearing up uh, maybe a disputed account, maybe a collections account, and uh, you know maybe an error on the credit report. If that doesn't work, then we're looking at a manual underwrite. And manual underwriting is a longer process. A lot of lenders don't offer it, um, and it can be more expensive. Also, are a lot of stipulations inside of manual underwriting. It's not impossible, but it's not the most fun to go through, <laughs> okay? Uh, so again, not available with all lenders. Expect more paperwork, longer closing times, and a higher interest rate. So this is used for people who have no credit score loans and refer loans. Refer loans are those thumbs down. When the underwriting software gives a thumbs down, it doesn't actually give a little thumbs down. It says refer with caution. Uh, so it can either be approve eligible, meaning the loan is approved, or refer with caution, meaning refer to manual underwriting um, with caution <laughs> is basically what it says. So either you have no credit score and we need a manual loan, or you got a thumbs down from the underwriting software and we need a manually underwritten loan. So manually underwritten loans just mean that an underwriter is going to have to look at your loan file line by line instead of a software, and they're going to look at it with more scrutiny and with more rules. So the way payment history works, if you have a manually underwritten loan, is in the past 12 months, you can have zero late payments, okay, on housing and installment loans. Um, installment loans are, uh, you have one balance and you pay it down monthly to zero, okay? So like a car loan or a mortgage or something like that. A revolving loan is something like a credit card. Uh, so in the past 12 months, you can have two 60-day lates, zero 90-day lates, okay? In the past 24 months, there's no rules on the revolving, uh, but you can have a maximum of two 30-day lates, okay? Um, then we go over here. Manual underwriting loans also have limits to their debt-to-income ratio. We talked about those limits with the automated underwriting software. The automated underwriting software doesn't share all of the limits with debt-to-income ratios based on your credit score. However, it does change, but they just don't uh, publicize that. With manually underwritten loans, 
you have to look at what your credit score is. Then it shows you the maximum ratio that you can have. And then you need what's called a compensating factor. So for instance, with this chart, what we would look at is let's say you have, uh, you know, the underwriting software gives you a thumbs down. And let's say that um, you have a, oh, let's say a 580 and above. So we have these two options here. And let's say we want to get approved for 3747 because we want to buy as much house as we can. So we're going to look here. This is saying we need one of the following, either verified and documented cash reserves, usually three to six months worth, um, minimal increase in housing payment or residual income. And your loan officer can help you run through all these things. We can see all these little stipulations uh, tacked on to the manually underwritten loan. Um, so again, these are absolutely possible. It's just a lot easier to go through the automated underwriting experience um, and your loan officer can help you through that. So some special requirements here uh, or special features is DACA is allowed, FHA is allowed for DACA recipients. Um, you just need an employment author authorization document um, to be able to qualify. Also house hacking like we covered. Uh, then also FHA has what's called a 100 down HUD real program. Um, so these are really difficult to find. Uh, but if you go to the HUD home store, you can find um, housing of urban development uh, foreclosed properties. And actually, you can get an FHA loan with $100 down instead of 3.5% down. Again, super difficult to find these homes, but just should point it out. Um, you can get a 203K. It's a type of rehab loan that you can get with FHA. I'm going to cover a little bit more detail with that. There's also the bridge strategy I'm going to cover here in a second. You can get down payment assistance. And FHA also has a one-time close construction option, not available through most lenders and can be really difficult to find and get. But this is where you would purchase land and then also finance the loan to build on the land all at the same time. So, um, and then when it comes to refinancing, because you have this loan, you want to potentially maybe refinance in the future. Uh, FHA allows what's called a streamline refinance to a lower rate. So you have to wait at least six months and also the market rate has to be lower. Uh, so let's say after six months of living in the home, uh, interest rates drop, you can get an, a new refinanced uh, FHA loan with a lower rate without having to prove uh, income history, credit, or appraisal again. Also, what's really common is to go from FHA to conventional. And this is primarily if uh, your credit score increases or to remove the mortgage insurance premium uh, just to refinance into cheaper debt, right? Because mortgages are just debt. And what we want to do with debt is just anytime we can get cheaper debt, let's go to the cheaper debt uh, instead of paying more for it. Kind of the same way with, you know, if you have a credit card that's 25% interest, well, if there's an option to get a credit card at 15% interest, that's going to be a better option than the 25% interest. Same thing with mortgages is, you know, we have an FHA loan where, while well, it's not a terrible loan by any means, there is cheaper debt available. Uh, and if we can't qualify for the cheaper debt, Let's use the FHA loan, work on what we need to work on, talk to your loan officer about what you need to work on to qualify for conventional, and then refinance into the cheaper debt in the future. Also, you can get cash out uh, with FHA, but you have to have a minimum of 20% equity. So let's say you've paid down your home to like 50% equity. You could pull cash out to use towards you know savings or paying off debt or uh, whatever you want. So some rehab options in here, two primary rehab options with FHA. You have a 203k standard and a 203k limited. The standard is for uh, work um, primarily exceeding $35,000. It has to be a minimum of $5,000 worth of work and it can cover structural repairs. And I have a whole video. Uh, you can just search when the house you love uh, 203k covering this. There's also a limited one. The maximum is $35,000 in repairs. There is no minimum and there's no structural repairs allowed with that. Now, the bridge strategy, this is what uh, I commonly suggest to people if they are looking at FHA loan, is again, FHA should not be this like long-term option that we hold for 30 years because FHA is not bad. There's no moral quality to loans. There's no moral quality to money, to be, <laughs> to be frank. Like an FHA loan isn't good or bad thing. It just exists. It's just a tool. Um, and really, when we look at like tools, like if you're using a hammer or a screwdriver, like which is going to be the best tool for the job uh, for some people? And FHA is the tool that they need for the job at the moment of qualifying for a home, getting that home, building appreciation and amortization, building equity in the home, and then refinancing to cheaper debt in the future. So that's the bridge strategy. We use the FHA loan almost as a bridge uh, to get us to a better loan. So 
In this, you would use FHA to lock in a home and build appreciation and amortization. So maybe you're in that spot where you're like, hey, I have a 580 credit score. And, you know, building my credit was probably going to take maybe a year or two to get it to where I need to be to qualify for a conventional loan. Well, you can buy a home now with an FHA loan, uh, build the appreciation in that, right? Home values have appreciated a ton over the past two years. Uh, build also the equity in that because when you're renting, you don't build any equity compared to owning a home. While you then own the home, you want to work on what you need to. And these can be things like your credit, uh, increasing your income, um, uh, lengthening the seasoning that you had from maybe a, a, a bankruptcy or something like that. And then also working on your debt to income ratio. Maybe you need to pay down debts to qualify for a conventional loan. Then after you've worked on all of this, refinancing into a conventional loan. We use the, the FHA loan as a bridge, maybe over you know one to five years to then refinance into cheaper debt in the future. Okay, and then finally, uh, success rate and seller perception. Uh, FHA loans are just less attractive than conventional. They shouldn't be uh, because if you're approved for it, you're approved for it and it should close just the same way that a conventional one would. And actually what a lot of sellers don't realize is conventional loans are much more finicky than FHA. Because FHA is more lenient, there's a lot more room for things to change. Where on a conventional loan, uh, people often can be on the line of qualifying for conventional. It can be actually more shaky than an FHA appraisal, just because there's a lot more leniency on an FHA uh, approval. Um, as the market cools, it's beginning to get more accepted to sellers. Um, nationally, around 10% of loans uh, are FHA. And then I want to show you really quickly a clip from my friend and wonderful real estate YouTuber, Javier Bedania on uh, FHA loans. Just six to eight months ago, FHA was having some bad luck. And, and, and specifically my market here in Phoenix, they were only made up 6.6% .6 of all home purchases, whereas cash made up 30.7 and conventional made 56.3. So as the market has been turning, and of course everybody and their mother are saying it's a terrible time to buy, one person who has made out great out of this is FHA buyers. FHA buyers are now responsible for 13.3% of all purchases, and cash purchases have dropped down to 24.9. So yes, with less buyers means you have a better opportunity to get not only an FHA accept offer accepted, but you know getting extra stuff like uh, additional closing costs to buy down rates, additional closing costs to potentially pay your closing cost. Um, so you're gonna put yourself in a lot better position as an FHA buyer. So it's back to basics, folks. You're no longer at a disadvantage having an FHA loan. When you're making an offer, make sure you do some research beforehand, figure out the seller's equity position, meaning how much they own the house, and figure out what the offer offer situation is. If it's a no offer situation, you have leverage. You have the ability to go in aggressively on the price, go in aggressively on the closing costs, and really go there and, and once again, doesn't matter what loan you have, you're a, a solid buyer. Go and get your money, honey. Um, now, just because the market is cooling doesn't mean that there's houses that are gonna hear that because there's there might be great houses that just have multiple offers. Yes, believe it or not, they're still out there. Uh, we just, a recent client of mine just lost on a three offer situation. So if it's a situation, you know, your, your leverage is a lot lower and even if you're FHA, still make a strong offer. If you need closing costs, maybe add them on the purchase price or maybe not go as aggressively as the others. So you're now part of the, part of the game. You're part of the playing field. So uh, stop looking at yourself at a disadvantage Go out there, get her done. Back to you. Uh, this is win the house of your dreams. Uh, Javier Vidania, back to you, Kyle Seagraves. So please go over and subscribe to Javier Vidania's uh, YouTube channel. Also, he has a Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash Javier Vidania, the link will be in the description. Has a ton of resources and you can connect with him directly there if you would like to. So ultimately, you want to make your offer stand out because again, from the seller perception, it's not the most favored loan. So what we can do to make our FHA offer stand out is one thing we could do is not ask for seller credits or we could reduce the amount of credits we ask for. The more that we're in a buyer's market, the more leverage you have to go with FHA and ask for seller credits. The more we're in a seller's market, the more that sellers tend to prefer conventional loans and they don't want buyers to ask for credits. Um, also, you can have a limited inspection contingency. I would never suggest waiving your inspection contingency entirely. I think that every home, uh, every home buyer should have an inspection done. But what you can do is you can say, we want an inspection contingency. However, we're not going to nickel and dime you. 
we're only going to ask for requests that are above, let's say, $5,000, or you set the limit. Maybe you talk with your realtor and you say, we can't spend more than $3,000 out of pocket, so we'll only back out of the deal or ask the seller to remedy problems if they're above $3,000. Because sometimes sellers don't want to feel like they're going to get nickel and dimed when you do an inspection. Um, so that can help with your offer there. Also, get a rock-solid approval and ask for a quicker closing. So talk with a loan officer. Make sure that everything is all documented and buttoned up. Ask them what the closing time could be. Um, and then have your loan officer submit your documents and everything to an underwriter ahead of time um, to get that closing done quickly. And we can do that too. Just go to winthehouseyoulove.com, set up a consultation with us, and we can talk you through that. So ultimately, how do you get one? You can get an FHA loan with most lenders in the US. Of course, I would love for you to talk with my team and get an FHA loan with us or look at other loan options with us. So what you can do is schedule a free home loan consult with my team. Um, and you can do that by going to winthehouseyoulove.com. You'll then see your FHA quote and maybe other loan options that you qualify for to see if there are other better alternatives for you. You'll then shop for your home and then you can write an offer. And then we're going to help you close on the loan. And ultimately, when do you start? Uh, really, I don't think there's too early in the process to begin this because you want to start looking at your decision making numbers as soon as you possibly can so you can plan appropriately for the next steps in the future, right? We want to spot any roadblocks, any hurdles, anything that's going to get in the way of your goal as soon as we can. That way you can do the right work, the right meaningful work before you find a home and then you aren't able to purchase it because the payment was higher than you expected or there was something in the way of your credit from you being able to qualify for a home. Okay, so please reach out to us. We'd love to start that conversation with you and see if FHA is the right option for you.